It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the injury. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the injury. It's about the recovery. It's about the recovery. Hi, folks. Paul Pata with you on the Paul Pata Podcast. Today, we have a really special guest. I am so honored to have Judge Michael Villani on the show. Welcome, Judge. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. How are you coping in these uh, crazy times? Well, it's, uh, we have to adjust the way, the way we conduct our business at the courthouse. Uh, I am still at the courthouse. I have court three times a week, doing a lot of work from home, remotely, doing a lot of work on the computer but we're trying to get through our cases as best we can. Now, I obviously know you very well, and I think any attorney who ever goes to court knows you. You've been a very long-term serving judge. You've been on the bench 13 years? 13 years since April 2007, and I'm up for re-election this year in 2020. That's wonderful. You are, I think, unique in the sense that you preside over both civil and criminal cases. Is that right? Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, uh, when I first started, I uh, was assigned about 2,000 wow. civil and criminal cases. 2,000 cases? 2,000 cases. Cases. And then in uh, 2012, when we, we received some new judges, our caseload went down to about 900 mm -hmm. cases. So. Yeah, it, to, to folks who are watching and are not familiar with the Clark County District Court, can you explain um, what type of court is that? Because, you know, you have the municipal courts, you have the justice court. What's the difference between those courts and the district court? In district court, uh, two aspects, civil and criminal. Any type of lawsuit, basically, that you're going to be involved in for medical malpractice cases, personal injury cases, breach of contract, corporation, those go into district court. In the criminal realm, anything that's a gross misdemeanor, which means anything that's punishable for up to 364 days and above, and if you're felonies, anything with a year or more in prison mm -hmm. would be a felony. So those are the, we handle the, the, those type of cases, the larger cases in district court. Mm -hmm. In terms of the consequences and what's at stake as far as criminally, uh, in terms of what a person could be facing, those are the cases, if it's a felony or a gross misdemeanor, those are the cases that end up in district court. It's there. And also, you know, for the criminal cases, we handle everything, like I said, that you could have up to 364 days in jail, up to a death penalty case. So everything in between sexual assault cases, burglary, robbery, fraud cases, we handle it all. Mm -hmm. And again, also, just generally civil, we would handle, I, I've had a First Amendment case. We've handled zoning issues, mm -hmm. uh, corporation issues, products liability, personal injury, yeah. just everything you could think of we handle in district court. Sometimes I wake up and I feel like we're in a sci-fi movie or something. I guess it happened in 1918, there was the Spanish flu pandemic, but we've never had anything in modern history come close to this. It's affected almost every aspect of our life. And I know it certainly impacted the court system. H how have you, as a just a individual, how have you been dealing with this coronavirus? Well, you know, I, I think for everyone in our community, it's very isolating. Even, you know, we, we were restricted from seeing our own family members. One of my grandchildren had a birthday party and we all drove to the front of their house, yeah. stayed in our cars and yeah. sang them happy birthday. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, other families are going through the same thing. Sure. A at the courthouse, uh, we're wearing masks and gloves. Yeah. Uh, everything is through electronic. We don't ha we don't even touch a piece of paper anymore at the courthouse yeah. because of the concern for the COVID virus. Right. I, I think that the court has handled it exceptionally well. It, it's really challenging when you stop and think about the number of people that come through a courthouse every day. Uh, you as a judge, you have to preside over all kinds of hearings. I, I'm a lawyer, I can come in, appear in my one individual case and leave. You have to sit there and deal with all of this. And so I, I, the courts are by definition, open to the public and they have to be accessible and you deal with people's problems. But now we have this whole coronavirus on top of all that. What are some of the biggest challenges the courts had to deal with? Unfortunately, when the coronavirus shut down our community and it shut down part of the courthouse, we had to put on hold every single jury trial, yeah, that's both civil and criminal. Am I correct that you're one of the top three judges in the Clark County District Court in terms of the number of jury trials you presided over? Since taking the bench in April 2007 through December 2019, I've conducted the second highest number of jury trials of all district court judges. Wow. So I'm proud of that fact. I love doing jury trials. And if someone needs to go to court, they, they need their day in court and they need a judge willing to, to uh, 
preside over their case. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, majority of cases are settled through uh, negotiations, settlement conferences, but if you can't settle it, then we need to go to court and you need yeah. that opportunity. Since the uh, COVID virus, uh, we, we had to cancel all jury trials yeah. since March, mm -hmm. both civil and criminal. So That's it's really been job. hard on the practitioners such as yourself, the people you represent won't, are, are not having their day in court. Fortunately, because things have sort of leveled off a little bit, we have now scheduled for July 27th okay. uh, to commence criminal jury trials. Okay. But we're going to have to handle those very carefully because yeah. the virus is still around sure. and there's a lot of procedures that we're going to be following handling the criminal cases. And our goal right now is to resume the civil cases mm -hmm. uh, probably first week or so of September. Again, this is still contingent on September, September of this mm -hmm. year, still contingent on if we're keeping the numbers down yeah. uh, of the new um, new infections as well as the hospitalizations. But that's our goal because we have to get back to the, uh, the job at hand is trying cases. I wrote an op-ed recently and the thesis of this op-ed was that, you know, I just really hope jury trials are not the next victim of COVID-19. The jury trial system is so unique in America and I think it's kind of like really almost a, in some respects the cornerstone of our democracy, the idea that we have citizens who come in and, and, and are the ultimate deciders of issues with the judge, you know, sort of umpiring as a referee, uh, the process. Just as a practitioner, I know, I mean, now with COVID-19, how you pick a jury, all of these things are, are gonna be significantly impacted. Can you walk us through, like, what, what is the court dealing with and wrestling with as far as the type of issues in terms of how you're gonna administer civil jury trials and, and then what things are, is the court doing to uh, not only balance people's safety with respect to COVID-19, but then also making sure these trials proceed? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I am on the jury committee, and so I'm part of the committee uh, working with the chief judge to try to figure out how we're gonna do these. Uh, presently, like I said, we, we are planning on commencing jury trials in, in September. The jury would be selected in the jury commissioner's chambers. The jury commissioner chambers holds, I believe, between three and 500 people. This way we can spread them out in that room yeah. so they can have the social distancing that's required under our restrictions. Yeah. And so also, also for the potential jurors to feel comfortable coming down to the courthouse. And that's an important point. I think people need to know if they get a summons in the mail, the, the, the government and our, our court system is doing everything possible to make people comfortable and safe. We've updated our jury summons. There's, there's a, a new box at the top of the summons, and it's gonna talk about what we're doing at the courthouse to make sure that they will be safe. It may be a little difficult for the attorneys and, and the court staff, but it's something we're just gonna have to work through for yeah. quite some time, unfortunately. And then the jury would be conducted in one of those courtrooms. And again, we will recognize social distancing in the courtroom. So the jurors' seats will be spread out. We will we'll give you that six feet in between each of the your fellow jurors. Okay. What, what is the future of our court system? And when I say that, I mean, you know, how things are configured, you know, and that's gonna not only, if, uh, I have a friend who owns a restaurant and he and I were talking yesterday and he was just telling me how difficult it is for him to remain in business. And one of the things he explained to me that I, I had not even thought about is that now in this new era of COVID-19, and even if we find a cure for it, People just have a heightened concern about, you know, how close they are in proximity to other people. And he was explaining that he has to kind of reconfigure some parts of his restaurant. Is that where we're headed? Is, are, are we going to see that in our court system as well? Well, I, I think people are going to be concerned about this until we have a vaccine. And that's going to, you know, it could be a year. Everyone talks about different time frames. But until we all feel comfortable, I think we're going to have this... Uh, like I said, we're going to have to configure our courtrooms differently. We're going to probably still pick the jury in the jury commissioner's chambers for quite some time. The person receives a jury summons, they're going to be concerned about the, sure. the COVID virus. Judges have to be, um, you know, aware of that and also be sympathetic to those concerns because yeah. we don't want someone sitting there listening to a very important civil case or criminal case where they're not paying attention because they're concerned about their fellow jurors sitting, you know, six feet from them. It's hard for the practitioners to conduct business, hard for the court system, but something we're just going to have to work through. Hey, you know, the other thing that concerns me as a, a trial attorney, and just uh, studies have shown that minorities are at greater risk um, of COVID-19 for whatever reason. Uh, there's all kinds of sociological reasons for why that might be. Um, I believe that almost, I read a statistic somewhere that 50% of the people 
with COVID-19 in Las Vegas uh, are Hispanic. And it, obviously one reason for that is we have a large Hispanic population, but also a lot of folks, you know, who may um, be on the front lines, whether they work in a casino or whether they do a service type job, maybe more at risk. And then also another demographic are elderly folks, right? People who may have a higher risk of uh, not a bad outcome with COVID-19 because of the, their age. And just as any human being gets older, we're more susceptible to things. My fear is that, uh, you know, I just hope, I hate to see those type of people being excluded from juries. So we end up with a, a different type of pool. And I think that's something I think the court's gonna have to struggle with, right? Is making sure that the jury is reflective of the community. Well, absolutely, for whether civil or criminal, the best jury is a jury of the good cross-section of the community. Yeah. Also for the last three years, I, I don't know if you knew this, I've been on the jury diversity committee. Yes, and, and we're addressing that specific issue to make sure that we're reaching out to every uh, segment of our community. We've been keeping the stats on that to make sure we as a court system is doing everything we can to reach out to everybody in the community because the best diverse jury you can get is gonna make the best decision, yes. whether civil or criminal. Right. And uh, right uh, before COVID, our numbers were improving for both African Americans and also the Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the African American community, I, I believe is around 10.8%. Mm -hmm. uh, 18% of, of each group are, are not qualified to be jurors because of age. So maybe we're at the 10% or 9%, 9.8%. Mm -hmm. And we were close to those numbers of getting those individuals coming into the courthouse yeah. to honor their jury summons. Uh, Hispanic communities, between 30 and 32%, so we're dealing with the same percentage. And we were up to about 24, 25% of getting those individuals into the courthouse. So we've always been working on it. We're trying to improve, make the system better. Uh, but like I said, with the COVID situation, uh, you know, there's some reports that perhaps African Americans that are higher risk, mm -hmm. uh, clearly the elderly. Uh, if you are over 65 years of age, you can ask for an exemption from yeah. serving jury. You can waive that exemption, and I've had people do that, but you can be exempt. You can ask for it mm -hmm. when you get a jury summons. You just contact the court system, and we will release you from that okay. treatment. Uh, again, we are going to be very mindful of the concerns that the potential jurors have. And so if they have a very strong concern and they don't feel comfortable, we're not gonna force them yeah. to sit there and possibly be exposed to the, right. to the virus. Mm -hmm. All right, putting COVID-19 aside, okay. uh, this is an amazing city. And I know, I think you grew up here, right? Right, well, I've lived here for 59 years. Wow. Well, actually, uh, 60 years now. I just had my birthday. I thought you were uh, only 40 years old. No, <laughs> just had my birthday last month, matter of fact, just yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, so I've been here 60 years. Wow. Uh, went to all the, you know, Hyde Park, yeah. Clark High School, and graduated from UNLV. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, uh, we did not have a law school, like Boys yeah. School of Law. So anyone here that graduated from UNLV or UNR had to leave the state. Yeah. to go to law school. So I had to go to San Diego uh, to get my uh, law degree. And but I love Las Vegas, so I came back after law school mm -hmm. and I've been practicing here since. Um, married to a very beautiful lady. Uh, we have six children between us, seven grandchildren. So this is my home and I have a vested interest in my home. And I've met your wife. She's a wonderful lady, She's a school teacher formerly, right? right? And still She's, involved. Right. She's, uh, she retired from uh, being a school teacher after 25 years. Wow. And after three months of the summer vacation, uh, she went back to teaching. My mom is a kindergarten teacher, so I have a soft corner for teachers. Right. They, they have a really amazing and important job, and often they don't get the recognition they deserve. Well, absolutely. Even during the COVID uh, you know, shutdown, she was still, uh, because she was working at a charter school, she was uh, preparing assignments for the kids and sending them out from our home. We, were, we, we had an assembly line at our kitchen table and putting the assignments together and worksheets together, and she sent them directly to the kids' homes. Awesome. And she's also uh, long distance or via Zoom, also going to someone's home and you know, meeting with them in their front yard, yeah. tutoring wow. some of her students. So wow. bless her heart for that. And like I said, teachers, I mean, that's, you know, they have the toughest job and one of the most important jobs. They really do. Yeah. Well, did you ever think growing up here that you would end up, uh, we would have a, the a hockey team and the Las Vegas Raiders <laughs> in no, Las Vegas? It was just, you know, uh, back in the day, I remember they called UNLV Tumbleweed, Tumbleweed Tech. Yeah. It was just a desert area, and now it's just, it's just a beautiful community. You know, 
I, I love it here. I, I would never leave Las Vegas. Yeah. It's just my home, and I've made such great friends here, both from city, from uh, kindergarten. I still I still know some people yes. that I, that I went to kindergarten with yeah. back in the day, and then meeting new people every day here as a judge. Well, I bring a lot of that up because you know there's been so much dramatic change. I mean, I moved here in 2004. And even in that period of time, there's parts of Las Vegas. I drive up and down Eastern sometimes. I don't even recognize that street anymore. It's become so busy. And we have had uh, so many people move to Las Vegas. And I definitely see the future of the city is being very bright despite everything that's going on. But I know, and I bring this up because obviously that puts more, that presents more challenges for our court system. Um, I'm sure you practice in the old courthouse. It was a different era. I have lawyers. I wasn't here at the time, but I have lawyers tell me about what it was like. Well, I remember when I uh, first started as an attorney, we, I think we had six district court departments, and those do departments handled civil, criminal, and the family court matters. Wow. We now have 32 departments, civil, criminal, and 20, I believe it's 20 departments in family court, which, and they just received approval for six new departments yeah. there. So it's grown quite a bit. Well, Judge, I just want to say I've appeared in front of you many times. I've been peer, appeared in front of a lot of judges. And I got to tell you, uh, one thing I've always enjoyed about you is you have a great judicial temperament. You're always an even keeled person. Uh, you have a sense of humor. I, you're very outgoing. I've, I've bumped into you at Starbucks near the courthouse. Uh, you're one of those people that's involved in the community and you haven't lost your personality, which happens to some people who get on the bench. You're still very grounded and I, it's really, truly, um, I think we're very fortunate to have you as a judge. Thank you for all you do. Well, I appreciate that, Paul. And you know, I'm running for re-election and I hope, you know, I'm, my plan is to continue working and I love the job. I love this community and uh, I look forward to uh, six more years on the bench and thank right. you. Thank you. Best of luck. Folks, that's a wrap for another episode of the Paul Pata Podcast. We've been so honored to have Judge Volani uh, talk to us about the civil jury system, which is, um, I believe, the cornerstone of our democracy. It's, it really is one of the defining features of this great country of ours. Please be safe out there. And until next time, take care.